thank you so much. So hi, I'm Kim Adler. I am a data translator at Pfizer, which is a combination of a data scientist and a product manager. And I'm really excited to talk to you about how we were able to do document chunking and graph rag using Neo4j. So what is the goal of this project? Well, first of all, one of the biggest goals for Pfizer is to get medicines to patients faster. And this project aims to do that by getting knowledge to the people who work at Pfizer faster. So what is the challenge here? So it's actually very difficult to find relevant information within documents. And why is that the case? Well, first of all, Pfizer is a really big company. And so there are millions and millions of documents out there. And not just a large quantity of documents, but they come from a variety of different sources. So internally, Pfizer has different pillars like research and development and global supply, and they document everything in their own way. Additionally, we have documents that come from external parties, like from acquired companies, vendors, and the CMOs. So with then, we also have even more formats of documents that we're not even aware of. Uh, and finally, most of these documents are sensitive. They contain intellectual property, and so we're limited to technology that ensures that our sensitive content does not leave Pfizer. And to give you a specific use case for where it's really important to find relevant information is called technology transfer. And this is the process in which a new product has been approved to be commercially manufactured. So people within R&D work with people from global supply to transfer over documentation and tacit knowledge to each other. And if it's really difficult to find the relevant documents, this can speed up, this can um, hurt the amount of time it takes to bring drugs to patients. So it's really important to make sure that people are able to find relevant information quickly to not hold up the manufacturing process. So what is the solution? So we need a general purpose methodology, general purpose because again, we're dealing with documents of so many different formats, many unknown at a very large scale. So a methodology that's able to tackle like 90% of those cases that does document chunking and retrieval augmented generation in a secure way. So what was the technology that we used? Well, we used Tesseract and we used Neo4j. And I'll get into both now. So Tesseract, how is this a general purpose technology? So fortunately at Pfizer, the vast majority of documents have PDF renditions to them. So even though we don't know how these documents are necessarily structured, we can at least leverage the fact that there is a common file type. And fortunately, it's really easy to convert PDFs into images for optical character recognition. And why is Tesseract specifically general purpose? There are many methods uh, associated with uh, Tesseract, um, some of which can provide a really granular level um, overview of where each word is located in the document. And because we have such a granular overview, we have flexibility to roll up words into different size chunks. And finally, Tesseract is secure. We leverage the Python implementation of Tesseract called PyTesseract, and this is something that you can import locally on your computer. So why Neo4j? Well, Neo4j is general purpose because it allows us to take chunk sizes, chunks of different sizes, and connect them to each other. And then we're able to perform vector similarity across all of those chunks, allowing for the optimal chunk size to be of any size in which we write into the graph. Additionally, Neo4j has vector indexes, which makes similarity search go really quickly. And we're able to write really generic queries relative to the optimal chunk to pull in connected data so that we can enrich the context for LLMs. And finally, Neo4j is secure. We have an enterprise license, which ensures that the text of documents and the connected information stays internal to Pfizer. So this is our pipeline. So first, we want to chunk documents using Tesseract. Then we write those chunks into a graph format using Neo4j. And then we use Neo4j to do graph rag. 
So let's first start with documents to chunks. So here is a little code snippet for how you can leverage the Pi Tesseract library. So as I mentioned, we leverage PDFs. So what you can do is use this uh, function called convert from path from this PDF to image library. Um, and what that does, it takes a list of all the different um, pages in the PDF and converts those to images. For simplicity for this presentation, I just limit it to the first image. Then you can pass that image object into this um, method for PyTesseract called image to data. So there's a lot of documentation on PyTesseract with many different methods. This one here you'll see shortly provides an extremely granular overview of where each word is located in the document, giving us flexibility to write up different chunk sizes. And then finally, you can take that and write it into a really clean data frame so that it makes it easier to then write those chunks directly into the graph. So here I'm going to show an example document. This is a publicly available document. It's a clinical trial result. And here we have here, this is called metadata. So oftentimes with our internal documents, we also have metadata. So for example, this document relates to cancer. It relates to this medication. These are things that we like to write into the graph and then connect to the chunk nodes that we have so that we can write our general purpose cipher queries to enrich the context for our LLMs. And then if I scroll down further, you see here that this is uh, the document itself. For simplicity, I just took the first page of this document. And what I did was I annotated what I believed would be the most optimal chunk sizes. Um, so here you have the Pfizer logo, you have the title. This potentially, this high level overview summary can make sense as a chunk. Then each of these pieces of information, like who the sponsor was, the medicine, the protocol number, are likely to be chunks in and of themselves, as well as the title of the study and the date of the report. And now I'm going to pull up the output from the Tesseract um, uh, OCR engine, and you'll see here we get a really granular overview of each word that is found. So here we have this text column, which corresponds to a word. We have a confidence level, so how confident the OCR engine was that this is an actual word on the page. So what I do is, is I actually restrict to those that have a confidence score of 70 or greater, but that's obviously something you can play around with. Here we have the actual bounding boxes of each word. And then what's really neat here is that there's almost a hierarchy of where each word sits on the page. So we have a word number, a line number, a paragraph number, a block number, and a page number. And you'll see here, for example, if I fix the page number and the block number to one, we get Pfizer, and that corresponds to this chunk here. Similarly, if I were to fix it again to the block level, so the page number and the block number to be two, we get clinical study results, and that matches this chunk here. Same for this piece here. If I limit it to the block size of three and page number of one, we get this exact chunk size. So this summary, scrolling it all the way down to the researcher's review. So now we might start thinking, oh, let's just assume every chunk size should be a block. Well, when we get to this part of the document here, we see that this is all in the same block, which is block four. So what it's saying here is all this information if we were to consider this to be a block chunk, would all be rolled up together. And so if someone were asked a question, what was the medicine studied, and all this information was in the chunk, it would make it less likely that this chunk size would be considered to have a high similarity score to that question. But we see here that if we look more at a granular level, like at the line number, we see that at the line number, we get the exact chunk size here. So this is a line chunk, this is a line chunk, this is a line chunk. So as you can see, in within just one page of a document, the optimal chunk size is very greatly. And so because we can take these optimal chunk sizes and write them in a graph, it allows for the possibility 
for um, us to consider all those chunk sizes as potentially optimal. So I'm going to go back to my slide here and talk about our next part, which is where we write the chunks to the graph. So as I mentioned here, we have different size chunks. We have lines, we have paragraphs, blocks, pages. We can write this all in a hierarchical fashion using like a contains relationship. Each of these has the text as well as the embedding that you use from whatever encoder model you want. And then references right to the, the line number, the paragraph number, block number, page number. And then you can traverse up these here. So for example, in one case with that paragraph, this would likely be the optimal uh, chunk that is returned for a question. But if someone wanted to ask what is the protocol uh, study called using the vector similarity capability in Neo4j, we would likely hit up on like a line chunk node. And then finally, as I mentioned before, not only do we have the text from the documents and those embeddings in the graph, but we can link them to the metadata as well. So we can enrich, say, the chunk text with, say, this medicine is this product and it's related to cancer and provide all of that information into an LLM to provide richer context for a response. So finally, the graph rag piece. What's great about Neo4j and Cypher is that you can write really generic queries that would work regardless of what chunk size is returned. So here we are calling our vector similarity search. I kept it simple by just limiting to the top result. We take back that node and notice we don't know what chunk that is. Like we don't know if it's a line, a paragraph or a block, but that doesn't matter because with Cypher, we're able to basically say, I know there's some number of contains relationships between the node and the page. It could even be zero, which is why we have that here. This node could itself be the page node. And then we know that there's a clear structure for the rest of the path. So we have the has section relationship to document, and then the document references the tag. And then we can return all this information, like what the chunk text was, what the page number was, so that people can validate the response of the document, which is really important. And then we can enrich the context further by providing the title of the document, the different tags like this relates to cancer, this relates to this product, just to provide a richer response from your LLM. So what has been the impact of this project? We've been able to scale this pipeline to enable GraphRag for over 35,000 documents, and these are documents that are from a very newly acquired company, Pfizer. So it was really, really important to make sure that the contents of these documents were made easily accessible to people at Pfizer as quickly as possible. And because they came from a newly acquired company, we had no insight into how these documents were structured. So with this approach, we're able to really quickly chunk documents and um, regardless of how they were formatted and get that information to people as quickly as possible. So lastly, I wanna say thank you. While I came up with the initial pipeline, this team took it so that we could scale it. They developed a full ML pipeline so that documents could be processed in a matter of seconds. So I wanna thank Jonathan Lowe, who's the director of the operations and insights group, Nathan Cerny, who's the director of DevOps, Marat, who's the DevOps engineer, Jonathan Stoll, who's our data engineer, and Dimitri and Joseph, who helped implement the user interface for the chatbot that's within our tool that makes this whole process seem abstracted away and seem very seamless to users. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for tuning in. And of course, don't hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. So thank you so much. Um, unless there's time for questions, I'm ready to pass it to the next presenter.